I'm Stephanie Sobe. I'm a part of the lectureship committee here at CRCDS and the Vice President of Academic Life and the Dean of the Faculty. And I am grateful for my colleagues who have worked so hard uh, to craft this week uh, with me and uh, to make this such an important conversation, not only for our school, but for our community. It's a joy for me to welcome uh, Josh Dubler here this day, Dr. J Josh Dubler from uh, University of Rochester. I had the opportunity to hear Josh speak about um, the abolition of the prison system um, about 18 months ago, and uh, I said we need that voice um, as a part of this conversation. And the work that he's done and the passion that he's brought to that conversation um, will be shared with you in a few moments. Um, next to him is uh, Reverend Karen Carter, who, um, I'll, I'll read the official title just so I make sure that I get this right. She works for the New York State Office of Children and Family Services, and uh, she's a 2000 alum here at CRCDS. And next to Karen is Thomas Van Strydunk, He's the deputy um, Monroe County Executive, and he's a retired United States Supreme. No, no. New York State. New York State, sorry. <laughs> oh, shoot, I want to bump you up, huh? New York State Supreme Court Justice. Although there's going to be an opening, I hear. I, I, I would right. accept it. For <laughs> <laughs> and finally, at the far end of the table is a soon to be CRCDS doctor. Uh, Daryl Bloodsaw, who will be graduating this year. He has, uh, he has defended, and the document is in uh, the library, so we could probably say it, you know, out loud. <laughs> Daryl's uh, work for his doctoral studies was in the, in the field of looking at uh, recidivism and the involvement of a local congregation, and um, he serves in New York City at the uh, First Baptist Church of Crown Heights. And so I welcome all of you and I welcome this amazing group of individuals to share this morning conversation. Um, th thank you, Stephanie, and, uh, and thanks uh, to all of you. Um, this is something, that, well, just for including me in this important conversation, and this is something that we're gonna to need to work on as a community in the years to come, and I look forward to engaging in that work with you. Um, I thought I was coming here this morning more or less to direct traffic, but, but I've been asked to, to pitch you on prison abolition, and, and I'm not inclined to turn down the opportunity to pitch you on prison abolition. So, so let me start by doing that for maybe eight to 10 minutes, and then we'll open up the conversation. Um, Is locking someone up in a cage a moral abomination similar to the moral abomination of one person owning another person? I think it might be. I think it might be. But that's not how I became a prison abolitionist. I became a prison abolitionist for a very concrete reason, which is that mass incarceration is a social and moral crisis, as I think we all agree. And I think if we are going to win and we are going to end mass incarceration, we need to become abolitionists. And being reformists isn't enough. Let me explain why. So I'm going to be pretty academic for a few minutes, OK? But, um, how did we come to this place? How do we come to this place that we have 2.3 million of our fellow citizens and non-citizens locked in cages, where we have 5% of the world's population and 21 or 22, or some say as high as 25% of the world's prisoners? How do we come by this place? I think there are three kind of broad accounts we can offer to think about how we got here. Um, the first which I think is, is, the, is, the real, is the movement account, which is probably the reason that we're having this conversation today, has to do with race and racism and prejudice. So from the events 
of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow from Ava DuVernay's documentary, The 13th, which I believe many of you have seen this week. We understand pretty well that there are some undeniable and uncomfortable continuities between slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. We know that's true. We know that uh, we lock up black folks uh, in rates that are simply off the charts. Yes. Off the charts. Yes. I think we lock up black folks at a rate of roughly <coughs> seven times what we lock up white folks. Mm. Here's the thing though. If we're, if, even if we only talk about how many white people we lock up in this country, you would still find that our incarceration rate today is three to four times what it was for most of our country's history and three to four times what it is for our peer nations like France and Germany. We lock up a lot of people. We lock up people of color in crazy amounts. But we also lock up white people uh, in large, large numbers. So race is clearly part of it, racism and uh, colorblind racism, as Michelle Alexander says, the war on drugs, um, and the nominally race-blind laws that are enforced in incredibly unjust ways in terms of racial disparities. We know that's true. Second story of how we got here is a story about economics and the changing economy. So if you watch the 13th, people like to talk about <coughs> private prisons and corporate profits as a motive for mass incarceration. And that's true. And it's especially true in the undocumented immigrant sector. And so it's very likely that we are going to see more of this in the years ahead. But it's much bigger than that. Um, Ruth Gilmore's extraordinary book, Golden Gulag, about mass incarceration in California, looks at the changing economy uh, and looks at the ways that, um, that prisons have become essential to the economy in a variety of ways, having to do in, to a large degree with surplus populations, surplus urban populations for whom there aren't jobs, surplus rural populations for whom there aren't jobs. And you know what? Having some people locked in cages and other people guarding those people, that works to help to deal with that problem. So just one example, I've been fostering uh, some of my colleagues teaching classes through Cornell's program at Five Points Prison in Romulus, New York. Romulus, New York had a military barracks until 1995 and a state mental hospital until 1995. And because they have a rainmaker state senator in 2000, they got a state prison, Five Points Prison. Wow. Okay, so this is, <coughs> the corporate profits are part of it, but it's beyond corporate profits. These institutions are embedded in our economy deeply. Second story. Uh, the third story, which uh, you also, if you saw the 13th, you saw, and it probably be familiar to you, is a political story. It's a story about political expediency and cynicism. And until a few years ago, we would have said, uh, Barry Goldwater, uh, Richard Nixon, law and order politics, damn those Republicans. But we know a little better now, right? And we know about uh, Bill Clinton and the 1994 uh, omnibus crime bill. We know about super predators and we understand that um, mass incarceration has been a political project, a bipartisan political project. If you're interested in thinking about this in the 1960s, you might look at Naomi Murukawa's book, The First Civil Right, um, or a, more rec a book that looks at a more recent period, uh, um, Marie Gottschalk's book, Caught. Uh, but we know that, at the very least, from after uh, Michael Dukakis stuck his head out of a tank and said that if someone raped his wife, he wouldn't want that person killed and he was ridiculed for that. We know that between 1988 and the financial crisis of 2008, there was no politician on the national level, Democrat or Republican, that was willing to risk anything on behalf of incarcerated people or criminal defendants. We know that over that period, and maybe the judge could speak to this, um, judges' powers to limit sentencing was taken away. And judges became subject to mandatory minimum sentences, and all the power shifted to the prosecutor's office. What they were going to indict, who they were going to indict, what kinds of charges they were going to bring. So those are three stories of how we got here, of how 
At this point in our history, um, 2.3 million people in prison. If you're going to look for uh, historical analogies to what we're doing, you look at Stalin's gulag. You, there aren't that many places to look. What we've been doing is without historical precedent. And, uh, but it had a beginning, and it's going to have an ending, and it's up to us to end it. So um, why I became an abolitionist, and then I'll open it up. Um, let me, as a thought experiment, here are three possible radical reforms, some of which we might want to talk about and some of which are only for the sake of argument. Three radical reforms we might undertake to end mass incarceration. And so these reforms speak to mass incarceration as a phenomenon of race and racism, a phenomenon of the economics, and a phenomenon of politics. Um, what if tomorrow we were to let out every nonviolent drug offender, every person who's in jail simply because they can't make their bail, and every African American person in state and federal prison? I've crunched the numbers. If we did all those things, we would reduce our prison population by roughly 55%. We would still have over a million people in prison, and we would still have an incarceration rate that was three to four times what it was for most of our country's history. So to me, it seems that um, if we're going to get anything, if we're really going to end mass incarceration, we need to dream big. We need to make huge, unrealistic demands. We need to move beyond the quantitative mass incarceration and move to the qualitative and say, what we are doing to people is an abomination. So mostly, you know, I get to teach students and, and, and I get to engage this part of the, of, of, the, of the struggle of trying to expand the moral imagination, trying to move to a place where justice doesn't merely mean locking somebody in a cage, but maybe justice means getting people in communities the things that they need in order to flourish. But that's a small piece of it. And my co-panelists are engaged in other pieces of this struggle. And um, what does it mean to engage in this struggle, whether as a reformer, whether as an abolitionist, and I'm not certain those things have to be opposed, to engage in that struggle on the ground at this moment in our history, that's what I hope we could talk about. So, Reverend Carter, Judge Van Strida, Stry, Judge Van Strida, <laughs> and Reverend Bloodsaw. <coughs> Would you kindly start by telling these good people about the work that you do, what called you to it, what are its challenges, and how, if at all, does it fit into this broader social crisis, moral crisis? <coughs> of mass incarceration? Well, I'll begin by saying that I engage on the front line uh, in the juvenile system. And so today, I'd like to give you, um, to focus you in what that looks like. I have been doing time for 16 years uh, <laughs> with juveniles. It's not, it's something that I came to realize this wasn't a call, I wasn't called to that. I just appeared one day and tried to figure out how I could relieve my anxiousness of walking through that gate when um, once I got inside and discovered it's, it's a school. Uh, the, uh, yes, the, ta the uh, Todd Hobart School. Um, but I still had this anxiousness of thinking about what is it going to be like inside when I got, have to walk through that iron gate that either shuts you in or shuts you out very quickly. And I began to be told that it was a facility and we didn't call it a prison. Prison, And I had a lot of conflict about that because of the images that I had. But what placed me was there, I, at the same time I started in industry, I was working as an anti-violence um, uh, uh, activist working with homicide victims. So at the end of the day when I left there and came to the facility, I was still working many times with that population. So in terms of our, 
our topic today, when I was in prison, uh, and you know, I, the word visit, I think about that a lot because I cannot do this job alone. You know, it just as a chaplain, I have industry school, which is a juvenile residential limited secure facility, and I have other facilities in Western and Central New York. I do, don't do this long. I have Reverend Dr. Ossie Heath Crump, who's here with me today, who's been a colleague of mine for two, uh, two years there. But the way it's done is with volunteers. You cannot do that type of work. At the time uh, I became, I was there five years part time, became full time, and had 11 facilities at that time. I could not believe at, the, at the, that time we had 33 juvenile institutions in New York State. I came from California. Now we're down to 11, four of those that I work in. So when I think about coming in and visiting, that word says we're coming to look upon. And to look upon, we're coming in to help for the purpose of helping. Jesus, we have a biblical mandate, right? Matthew 25 is a biblical mandate. And it says, that we are to look upon, to examine, to expect, right? For what? For the purpose of helping. To do what? To relieve. Now that's the, you know, the exegesis part of it. But for really what we are coming into, it's not a specialized ministry. It's no different than we visit the sick in hospitals and homes, right? Because we, that's how we relegate prison ministry. It's specialized, right? But it's right next to visit those who are in prison I mean, it's, it's right next to visit those who are sick in rest homes, hospitals, whatever. So I began to say after I, I got in and the person that hired me on the first day showed me up my office and showed me this wonderful historic chapel. Been there since nine, <laughs> I, one of our board, a former board of visitors is here today. And that chapel's been on grounds that the industry began as the Western House of Refuge, the New York House of Refuge, Refuge was the first model of a juvenile system here in New York State. And then on the western part of the state, we have the Western House in, an urban, in the urban community of Edgerton Park. Later on, we moved out to where we are in Rush. And why? Because there were some, at that time, they even struggled then with separating the bigger boys from the smaller boys, the youth from adults, right? So we've been doing program there for a long time. In my 16 years, I come in and they show me the chapel, give me my keys, and the person who hired me said, in 30 days I'll be retiring. <laughs> so, because we're bureaucrats, he told me two things. He said, no policy, and here's one person you can trust. So I had just graduated from seminary, so I started pulling on that experience, right? I had my friend, was, and it was, I started in December, so naturally I was gonna have a Christmas play. I, after I began to do that, I realized that, how is it that kids and staff even come to chapel? That there's this whole system in place that you have to work with, right? So as time went on, my first challenge was to integrate religious program and services into the facility program. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about this being a call, I never could figure out for a long time why did God place me there? When some of my good mentors here, I would look out and you know, they would say, you're pastoral. They say, would say, you know, you could, you, um, for there's some reason you were called here. And one day I realized when they opened our secure city, we were just talking about the facility that we, don't, we have down the road. That was a secure center uh, three years after I got there. This type of ministry is not specialized, it's just ministry. It calls us personally and professionally to do the work. And so what, began, what I began to realize was that I had to pull from those experiences. The Secure Center, the kids that are placed there are beginning at age 16 because they're placed by criminal court. And I know we're talking about raise the age. And when we talk about movement, that's a serious dilemma that we have right now to work with those kids. And when I began to do that work, I was transformed because all the things that I had knew and were comfortable with were turned upside down and they were turned right back at me. 
And what I mean by that, I found that I had, when I would go up there to meet with kids, after I had to force them to let me begin a church there on Easter Sunday, that I got challenged. First kid said, and he happened to be a kid who had murdered one of the victims that I had been out on four or five years ago. He says to me, get that Jesus stuff away from me. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm pretty, I can be pretty bold, and I stood in front of him, I said, you know, you don't have to come to church this Sunday, but you may need a chaplain while you're here. Then what happened was, I began to look at the kids I had at that time. I, outstanding are at least 10 kids who were serving time for murder, whether it was the murder of your ma mother and you were outcast, whether it was snipering a UPS worker, whether it was um, a younger brother coming and tell you that he, not sexually, but assaulted somebody, and then you go back and slit that throat. All these types of, of experiences started happening. And so I began to say, as we do as good Christians, to look for the remorse in that person. And if I could see the remorse, maybe I could help. Well, the one person that changed the way I minister was the one who I could not see the remorse. What I saw first was the darkness. But everything, but most of the kids had in adults, as I look, <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. I'm gonna ask you before I go too quickly, how many of you have kids that you have raised or are raising, whether they're your kids or someone else's kids? Okay. Now let me see a real show of hands by those of you whose kids have done some, as the kids will say, stupid things. <laughs> things that would change your life are things that you would have no control over and that things that would change their life forever. Well, kids, <laughs> thank you, thank you. For real talk, kids have done some really stupid things. And so what is our role? To push past that darkness and find that light and then to touch that remorse by our relationship, by coming in and doing time, whether we want to tutor, whether we want to come in and teach Bible study, but you've got to do the hard time with young men. And the biggest thing is not to freeze them. I, I like Howard, I like Howard Tulare who says that God is not a Polaroid God. He doesn't take a picture of that one thing that we did in our lives and hold that against you for the rest of your life and freeze frame that. But that's what we do to people who have harmed and hurt us, right? We freeze that and everything we do, we judge that. But God is a DVD God. He knows the beginning and the end. And so that's why we have to deal with kids because they do stupid things. Now, because I'm there and I think about that, this is not a specialized ministry, but if we are going to be judged by our deeds, then we have to help others to separate the darkness from the light so that God or the Holy Spirit can breathe and touch that light and that light can begin to flicker in the soul of that person and then they begin to feel that there is some forgiveness because you have spent time with them and you have let them see that they have worth and then I meet this young 16-year-old, had no, it seemed like he had no remorse, and I began to watch him, and I later found out that his defense counsel said that he was polite. And I, I'm like, that's so true, he is polite. But then everybody that wrote into the article in that newspaper demonized him. This young man taught me a lot. He taught me how I look at the church and the church's ministry because it was hard to get him to come at first. And then before he left, he was bringing the whole unit on his particular unit. And then he had competition on the next unit. And so I began <laughs> to have, they were like, oh, you got a little bit too many kids here in, in church. But never in that, in this five years, this is not industry, this is down the road where we were talking about. For five years, four Sundays, four services a Sunday, we, those kids were in church, in Bible study, in black history, because you know not only that, I'm a chaplain, I'm the social coordinator too. So I do all of those things. What he taught me was 
as I watched this develop before we were start, before we were talking about raise the age, when he became 18 and 19 years old, I began to see a shift in his thinking. He began to mature. He began to get in touch with that store owner that was a father and uh, a husband. And you know what he said before we moved him to another secure center? He said, I want to go down to, to industry and to tell the young men that I, I want to save a life because I took a life. Mm -hmm. At some point, the remorse was touched. At some point, that light came back. So then we closed that facility, because we're always opening and closing facilities according to the economic climate. So we sent him to another facility. I began to go in there, and you know what happened? He and another person changed the facility culture. It was remarkably different because of what he had learned. So when we want to talk about looking at kids as monsters and locking them up with the way we legislate, the way we vote or don't vote, the way we come in and we bring our goods but we don't want to spend time, that's wrong. If we want to abolish prisons based on, on you know, that type of, of change, then that's the way to do it. Lastly, I want to say that because I am a homicide survival, a double homicide survivor now, I want to now see that not only we could teach them to forgive and talk about the harm that they've caused, but bring in an opportunity for them to think about the harm that uh, others have incurred. And so just last fall, I went into Lancaster State Prison in California. And I sat with 15 lifers without the possibility of parole. And the one guy who I was a little nervous with when I sat down turned out to connect with what I said about a gruesome fact about um, what had happened to my sister. At the end, they all came over. They were so thankful, so grateful. Coming in, all they knew was I was a homicide survivor. They didn't know anything that I worked in the system or prison or facility. And they did not know that uh, I was an ordained minister. These guys are committing and still doing it today to work with younger felons. Most of them had 30, 40, and 50 years without the possibility of parole. We have no idea of what really takes place in those dark places. That real ministry does take place, and it takes place because of the attitudes and the perceptions and the way we look at people who are human and desire to be so. so. Thank you. Judge? My work experience started with four years in the United States Navy after I got out of college. After that, uh, I returned to law school and got my law degree. When I left, you can't hear back there, I'll try to speak up. Oh. The one right on the table, Dr. Ranch, right in front of me. Oh, this? Yeah. No, that's, oh, that's, that's what this is? That's, that's not a mic. There's this. Thank you, Steph. Take a best here. You can also take the left turn if you prefer. college and went to the uh, Navy. So I spent four years in the Navy, returned and went to uh, law school, got my law degree, and after law school looked for whatever job I could get. It wasn't a great time for hiring in 1971, or 73. Um, and I got my first job was with the uh, Monroe County District Attorney's Office. 
district attorney's office for five years. When I left the district attorney's office, I joined a firm that was uh, a litigation firm, mostly civil litigation. But in the 20 years I spent with that firm, I also did some criminal litigation where I defended people who were accused of committing crimes. Um, after that, I became a Supreme Court judge, New York State Supreme Court judge. I'd love to take the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> it had not been offered to me. I spent 15 years as a Supreme Court judge. So with the, within the system of uh, justice, I have <coughs> prosecuted people. I have defended them. I have sentenced them to jail. I have sentenced people to probation. I stood beside people who were going to go to jail and knew they were going to go to jail. And I advocated for prison sentences for people who I prosecuted and, and were convicted. Uh, to end mass incarceration, as uh, Josh has mentioned there, uh, is, is a goal that probably we all should have. But to end incarceration altogether is a discussion that we should have as well. Um, I was involved in the Arthur Sharcross uh, prosecution. Some of you who were here in that time know the uh, terrible things that uh, Mr. Sharcross uh, committed. Uh, and he was free after serving a prison sentence for having, I believe it was sexually abusing some young child. Uh, so there was a dark side of Mr. Sharcross that I believe uh, represented a threat to the community and incarceration was probably the only answer to protect the community. Um, you know, uh, incarceration or is, is thought of as being a form of punishment, is thought of as being uh, retribution, if you're looking at it from the victim's point of view, and is also thought of as being uh, a way of protecting society from someone's future conduct. Um, so to eliminate incarceration altogether would be a difficult concept. I don't believe that that exists in any of the societies that Josh was referring to that are uh, less uh, likely to lock people up. Um, it's a matter of trying to come to grips with why the United States incarcerates so many people for such a long period of time. And, uh, Sitting in the system for the 40 years that I had uh, before I retired from the bench, um, I have become convinced that we do lock up too many people for too long a period of time. And it, frankly, it starts from the moment the person becomes involved in the system. We have, uh, I was looking at some information before I came here today. For instance, of the 630,000 people that are in local jails during the study that uh, was done before 2017, but recently, of the 630,000 people that were in local jails, 443,000 were not convicted of any crime. They were there because they couldn't post the bail necessary to be posted. And that is a um, big societal cost. And I'm not talking just dollars. It certainly costs us a lot of money to keep people in jail. But it also puts people in jail, particularly younger people, uh, who are exposed to a element of the criminal justice system that we should probably be trying to prevent them from being exposed to. Um, even though we have systems called pretrial release services, which try to look at individuals and convince courts to release them until the case is disposed of, we see that situation where 440,000 people out of 630,000 have not been convicted of a crime but sitting, sitting in jails. Uh, that can't be uh, deemed to be a just a society when we do that. Um, Josh was saying we release all the nonviolent drug offenders, people who can't make bail, that's the group that I just talked about. And all African Americans, we would still have 50% of the jail population. Uh, I haven't heard that. A bit less. A bit, a bit less, but we'd still have over a million people, yeah. But you're not talking about all <coughs> nonviolent, you're just nonviolent drug offenders. That's the figure, right? Which I take from that Justice Policy Institute data. So 
So we have we have a, a I think a, a reasonable discussion to be had on whether we are locking people up for offenses that we shouldn't be locking them up for in the, in the first place. Uh, does a bookkeeper who um, finds herself up, uh, in a difficult situation and steals from her boss, does that person, uh, is it doing society any good and that person any good if they're in a state prison set, uh, system? Um, the other um, thing that I noticed as I was uh, working my set way through the system, uh, my latter two or three years on the bench uh, involved uh, a new statute that was passed, uh, Article 10 of the, I think it's the mental hygiene law, if I remember right now, but at any rate, it's the uh, civil commitment of sex offenders, uh, which started years ago, probably in the late 90s into 2000, when sex offenders were perceived as being uh, getting out of jail because uh, their sentences were too low <coughs> by the people who are worried about this thing. And uh, they were thought to be a threat to the community. And they passed statutes starting, I think, in the state of Washington and Kansas and the, uh, maybe uh, Oregon. And New York finally got on board uh, with passing uh, civil commitment to sex offenders. What happened was the sex offenders would get up against their sentence. They'd be doing 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they were gonna be released in society, at least they thought they were. The statute was passed and it allowed the warden um, of the jail to petition the courts to say this particular person is still a threat uh, to the community and he has, and the way they put the hook on it was he has a mental disease uh, which he cannot control and therefore he needs to be treated. So there's a whole uh, area of law out there now where uh, men, and it's mostly men, in the three or four years that I heard these cases, there was not a single woman that was petitioned under that uh, statute, where they are now incarcerated, <coughs> civilly incarcerated, and they don't call it incarceration. It's a facility they go to as well. They go to a mental health, what's called a mental health facility, but it's, I visited them, and if you can tell the difference between a mental health facility that these men go to and a jail, I would be surprised you put you in the, in the middle of them there. Because they're secure facilities. And <coughs> these individuals are dangerous individuals. The theory of sending them to the uh, mental health institution is that they will be treated and until the psychiatrists at the um, institutions certify that they uh, don't represent a threat to the community or themselves anymore, they continue to be treated. They could be treated for the rest of their lives in a locked facility. And if you saw some of the things that these men did, you would, some would say maybe they should be in a facility for the rest of their lives. But the question that you have to ask when you look at these things is, when the statute was passed, the uh, Senate and the Assembly decided they wouldn't put a nickel extra in the mental hygiene legal services uh, budget. Mm -hmm. So the person who uh, has to uh, tighten their budget for mental hygiene services outside of the civil commitment of sex offenders loses that kind of money that they have. What's it cost to put a, a man in um, state prison versus Civil commitment. State prison, I believe the latest figures I've seen is someplace between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year uh, above the uh, tuition of Harvard, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And this is state prison. You take them out of the state prison and put them in a civil commitment of sex offender, it's costing the taxpayer something like two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, you can't uh, treat them as prisoners, you treat them as uh, people who need mental services. Because they're not in jail, they're not locked up, they're not subject to a prison sentence. So the question that I had as I was listening to the different doctors testify about the uh, treatment is number one, I wasn't convinced that we have treatment for sex offenders who are uh, in the category that we would see. There are people who have been convicted three or four times of sex offenses. They're very seriously uh, mentally uh, disabled in my opinion. So I don't know if we have treatment so if we're locking them up, we're locking them up to prevent them. So that's called preventative detention. Our, our system of justice doesn't recognize preventative detention. 
The other question I had is if you had these people in jail for 15 years, why didn't you treat them? If you have treatment, why didn't you treat them? And there were no answers to that. So there's a, there's a lot in the criminal justice system other than uh, the racial connotations that Jas referred to uh, that make you scratch your head and wonder uh, if we know what we're doing. And that's just an example of one. The other thing that I noticed as I went through 40 years of practice is that the criminal justice system doesn't have the forgiveness in it that it had years ago. I uh, represented a kid who took any of you do any senior pranks when you were in high school? Okay. Yeah, most of us probably did. This kid, a bunch of kids, but I represented one of the four or five of them, um, in the uh, quad that was in the middle of the high school uh, building. It was a big piece of the lawn, and he took out, these kids went out one night, and he took out in the lawn, I forgot what year it was, but let's say it's 1986. So they put 1986, and he took the sod out of the out of the lawn and set it aside. So when you looked from the, the building, you saw 1986, the year they graduated. They charged him in criminal court. Uh, I don't think that would have happened in my days. I think in my days it would have taken me to my mother and father. So he's going to have to put that back. The rest of the kids. So we lack we lack a lot of forgiveness that we used to have in, uh, in our society. But criminal justice. The police officers used to be a little more uh, able to say, uh, go home and don't do this again. Now, if they do that, and their sergeants hear about it, uh, they are, they're brought up by charges. So uh, I think there's a lot of issues that we have to struggle with uh, beyond just the uh, uh, perception of the mass incarceration. Uh, and society would be much better off rehabilitating, uh, in my opinion, the people who they feel uh, are not violent to felons, then putting them in jail. Uh, but that discussion has gone on for years, and the, uh, Josh has alluded earlier to the fact that uh, at one point the federal courts restricted sentencing on, on uh, judges because they, for the most part, felt that the federal judges, some federal judges, were being too lenient than other federal judges, and so they passed a bunch of rules and they had a point system. If your crime was a D felony, you got this many points. If you, uh, all the things in your history, they'd have points and at the end of the points, the court could sentence you to 12 years to 14. And that was a discretion between 12 years and 14. Um, I believe that the federal rules have been changed and the judges have more discretion. Uh, but the argument and the discretion is kind of a two-edged sword if you uh, allow judges to have discretion, um, the chances are you're going to seriously disagree with some of the judge's discretion, particularly if you happen to be the victim of the crime. Uh, and if you restrict the judges uh, in their sentencing, you are taking away the ability for the judge to look at the case as a unique case. And they also be looked at, I think, as unique cases. Um, each individual that comes before you has a different history than the person before you and to categorize them and pinch them into these uh, uh, short periods of time, I think, <coughs> was a wrong thing to do, and I, I believe they corrected it in the federal court. We didn't have those restrictions in the state court, although there are mandatory sentences in the state court that we have to follow. Um, and then I'll just uh, quickly turn to raise the age, uh, as referred to earlier. Raise the age is predicated, I think, on a, a psychological school of thought that uh, the brain doesn't fully mature, particularly in the decision-making process, until well into the 20s, uh, particularly the male brain. Uh, my wife was of the opinion the male brain doesn't mature well into the 70s. <laughs> she has a biased outlook on it. And, uh, so we're gonna raise the age for the same reason that uh, uh, the psychologists and psychiatrists tell us we should probably be looking at uh, a lot more than 16 and 17. Our youthful offender statutes in uh, New York, is anyone under 19? That seems pretty restrictive in my mind. And uh, in fact, uh, I would be an advocate for what they call uh, first offender statute. So even if you're 60 years old, 
you know, you have your first offense, you don't have to carry that felony with you. I had an 89-year-old client who, um, his uh, son asked me to represent him on Webster, and this gentleman had keyed the car of the person who lived above him in the apartment complex. He was 89 years old. I think, you know, what, what is going on? Um, I met him for the first time. He was, you know, quite bent over and, and looked somewhat infirm. The reason he had uh, keyed the car was that the people uh, that lived above him were not married and he felt that that was sinful, so in his mind he had even keyed the car. He had never been charged with any crime for 89 years. And uh, I brought that to the attention of the court and said, I know he's a little past youthful offender statute, but can we take into consideration that an 89 year old has never been in any uh, trouble before? Um, we don't have that in our system. I think we should be thinking about doing something like that. It would take the um, stigma of a conviction and set it aside. Um, I think Andrew Cuomo was talking about after 10 years um, it, that they have uh, some sort of a statute that seals the record. I think that's too late. Uh, if you carry that felony with you for 10 years, you're 22 years old, if you try to get a job between 22 and 32, it's a big up to felony. That's a lot tougher than if you have a first offender statute that sets it aside like the youth will have but then again, I'm a Republican. I shouldn't be there. Before, so. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Reverend Bloodsaw. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, my goodness. Are you taking collection up, too? Yes, we are. Yeah. I, I, I want to make sure to get the message first so we can pass the tray. Um, I want to start this way. Uh, Josh mentioned earlier, if you allow to release all nonviolent drug offenders, the African Americans, and all those who are in prisons and in jails because they could not afford bail, uh, I'd like to add a little, a, a little bit of a different twist to that. Because I'd like to know what the numbers are if we release all the people who are in prison who are poor. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, uh, I was I was ill and at home uh, and could not sleep. And it was about three o'clock in the morning, and uh, I turned the television on uh, and just happened to go across National Geographic. Uh, they had a series. I don't know if it still runs now, but they had a series called um, "The World's Worst Prisons." Uh, the first one that caught my attention uh, it was it was San Quentin. Uh, San Quentin was packed to the gills, uh, largely with black and Latinos. Uh, I watched the, you know, they talk about the culture, all the things that happened in the prisons, uh, and I watched that full episode. Still wasn't, I wasn't sleepy, and so the next one that came on was the worst prison in Ecuador. Uh, and similar behavior uh, in the prisons and all of the people in the prison were Ecuadorian. That piqued my interest because in America, when we think about prison, uh, vastly we think African American black. Uh, that struck me that everybody in the prison, the prison was packed with the heels in Ecuador and there were no black people. Uh, they were all Ecuadorian. Uh, the next, uh, starts, I was up a long time, <laughs> interested now, because the next, uh, the next episode was going to be a Russian prison that was in the Siberian Desert. Uh, four days journey just to get to the prison uh, for those who felt the need, the desire to visit. Uh, it took four days to get there. This prison was maximum security. It was packed to the gills and there were no black people. It was all Russians, all Russians. The one thing though that was common in all three of the prisons, was that the vast majority of the people who were there were poor. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we begin a discussion like this and we talk about it being a social and moral dilemma, that's really where the fight begins. Uh, I, agree, uh, I agree with, uh, with, with Tom uh, in that um, uh, 
I'm not certain that we can abolish incarceration, but I also think that there's a difference between incarceration and mass incarceration. And we have to, we have to explore that middle ground uh, because every Monday uh, I go into Sing Sing and I teach New Testament. Uh, uh, and, and one of the things that I'm convinced of, having, uh, having been in the system now since last August, uh, is that there are some people who need to be locked up. It's a sad reality, but there are some people who need to be locked up. Uh, but there are a lot of people who have no business being locked up. Uh, a critical component, and those who do need to be locked up, is, is wrestling with and grappling with how long must people or should people be locked up. Um, there are people in my class, there are 15 students in my class. Uh, the, 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 the shortest stint is eight years. The greatest stint is 33 years. Uh, there's one gentleman who's in the class who is 32 years old. He's been at Sing Sing since he was nine, 19, and uh, he was locked up three years before that. And there's no release date in sight. Uh, seeing him, talking to him, reading the papers that he writes, um, I can tell you now that he has no business whatsoever being locked up for that long. He made one decision, one really bad decision, in the heat of the moment. And he's in touch with the family of the victim who had forgiven him. And he, like the gentleman that you talked about, is one who wants to, when, if when ever comes, work to help other young, he was 16 years old, when he committed the dastardly crime that he committed, he wants to work with other young boys to help them avert things like that. Part of why this is such a difficult thing for us to, to, to deal with uh, is that it's, it's a part of the, of the social fabric of who and what we are uh, in America. Uh, and and I, uh, I, I shared with Dr. McMichael uh, when, after I accepted this, this assignment to teach at Sing Sing, uh, that my initial reaction was, I would love to, but I can't. I can't, I was, I was finishing my, my thesis. <laughs> I, promised, I made promises to Dr. McMichael. Um, but my initial reaction is the same as so many of us who walk around every day free. I was too busy. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly take the time uh, to go into the prison uh, as, a, as a pastor, mind you. I couldn't possibly take that time because there were too many other things that were drawing and pulling at my attention. Uh, but but I, was, I, I, I exercised my faith before I said no and I prayed over it. And as it turns out, uh, the benefits for my going into the prison every Monday uh, have been far greater than the amount of time that I initially thought I would have to allocate. It has humanized me in ways that I did not know I needed to be. You know, I did mention I'm a pastor, didn't I? <laughs> it has humanized me in ways I did not know that I needed to be humanized. Uh, but, but it's a part of the social fabric, and when we, when we look at things uh, as, uh, I, I, I now live, I packed my family up um, like the Clampets, and we moved out to New Jersey last September. Uh, I lived in Harlem for, 20, for, for 21 years, um, uh, and, and now I live in uh, what, my, what my wife call, calls Happy Swell Meadows. Um, uh, it is uh, a middle class community of Wayne, New Jersey, and, uh, and, and I'm convinced, I, I, I've learned some stuff just in passing. I'm a junkie, I, I'm a junkie for news and for information. Worked for the New York Times for 11 years, and, uh, and, and so I, I need to keep up with the news, uh, no matter what, so I get these little alerts during the day. And I don't know much about Wayne, so I, so I signed up to get this little, um, this, these alerts anytime something newsworthy happens. Uh, from a service called Patch, and they and they send me all of this news and information about what's going on in in Wayne, even when I'm in Brooklyn. 
Um, and that has taught me something. The majority of the news and information I get about people breaking the law, people committing crimes, murder, drug busts, the vast majority of them are white. They're white people. Yet, when I turn on the six o'clock news, they're all black and Latino. If it, if it bleeds, it leads. I guess if it's brown, it'll stick around. That's, that's significant. And, and so as I, as I get these news alerts and my phone is buzzing, I'm, I'm looking at this thing, and all of a sudden now I realize there, there, there are two really important things at play here. One is the vast majority of the, the news sources that we get news from in America come from the inner cities. They report the news that makes news in the inner cities. Unfortunately, we're all uh, impacted by that, even those who live in the burbs, because what you see on television defies what you see outside of your house. You see on television, the six and the 11 o'clock news, someone with a hoodie on, being es uh, uh, escorted out of the court into the back seat of a car, and they're usually a brown person. Yet, what we read in the local, little, little, small, little newspapers outside is of people who look just like us. Why is that, why is that social? It's social because in the 1980s, with the crack epidemic, it was largely poor, largely black communities. We all know that you can't have crack if you don't have cocaine. Yet there were the great disparities in sentencing for those who had crack and those who had cocaine. Now we we'll fast forward to 2017, and every time I turn around, uh, uh, Chris Christie, uh, Donald Trump's friend who he refused to hire, uh, <laughs> decided that he needed to somehow pump up his, his sagging, terrible, deplorable uh, approval rating. And so now he has a campaign where uh, they've allotted monies in the state of New Jersey, and dare I say now, one of the biggest discussions on Capitol Hill is how to fund opioid treatment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> opioid addiction. Opioid addiction impacts and affects largely upper class, upper middle, and upper class whites. Crack impacted lower class, mostly, blacks and Latinos. The solution then was prison, of which some of them are still there. I see them. But now that it's no longer amongst the poor, we need government intervention to help solve the problem. I don't say that to say that we shouldn't be helping mm -hmm. now. It's the right thing to do. It was also the right thing to do then, but there's something called the profit motive. The profit motive drives, it drives and it fuels imprisonment. Two companies traded on the New York Stock Exchange, CCE, CCA, uh, Corp um, the Correction Corporation of America, and GEO. Multi-billion dollar companies being traded on the New York Stock Exchange. What do you need in order to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange? Anybody just yell it out. What do you need? I volume. You need volume. You need, and that volume means you need a commodity. You need a, and, and, and if you want to stay on the New York Stock Exchange, you need a, re, a readily renewable commodity. CCA and GEO have just that. Their commodity is black and brown men. They make multi-billions of dollars. CCA was started in 1983. Started uh, by someone who had connections with the Justice Department. 
In fact, the first client of CCA in 1983 when they started was the Justice Department. They started the company knowing that Ronald Reagan in 1992, October of 1992, was initiating his war against drugs. 82. What did I say? 92. That was a good year. Graduated from UGA that year. Water on the brain. 1982 is when Reagan initiated his war on drugs. What a, what a phenomenal opportunity. The reason that it, it continued, one of the reasons it continues now, is that most men and fastest growing population in the prisons is women. Uh, but when they when they released, they're released on conditional release, most of them. There are three conditions under which most of them are released. One, you have to find housing. You have to find gainful employment. 